Welcome everyone, and thank you for being here today. Before we begin our event, I'd like us to take a moment to pause and reflect upon the deep and enduring connections that Indigenous, First Nations, and Métis peoples have upon this land. I'd like to begin with two land acknowledgements. Waterloo Region, including the three cities and the four townships, is located on the traditional territories of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people. Waterloo Region is part of the Haldeman Track, which encompasses six miles on either side of the Grand River from the mouth near Dundalk to where it empties into Lake Erie at Port Mim. The use of this land was promised to the Odenosone Confederation on October 25th, 1784, to compensate them for the loss of their lands in upstate New York when they allied with the British who were defeated in the American Revolutionary War. Today, Waterloo Region is home to indigenous people from many distinct First Nations, as well as Métis and Inuit. We also want to acknowledge the land in which Halton Region operates. Halton is on the traditional land of the Mississaugas of the Credit, which is part of the Onishnabe Nation that extends from the Niagara Peninsula across Hamilton to Rouge River Valley. The territory is mutually covered by the dish with one spoon, Waba Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy, the Ojibwe, and other allied nations to peacefully share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We are deeply grateful to be able to work on this land, and we recognize that its original inhabitants are First Nation and Matisse people. We give thanks to the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation for sharing their, their traditional territory with us. Let us take a moment to pause and reflect. Welcome to Profound Impact Day 2022, an annual event. Profound Impact Day it celebrates the world's diverse leaders and change makers who are leaving their mark on the global community through their initiatives, influence, and impact. My name is Sherry Shannon Vanstone, President and CEO of Profound Impact. We launched Profound Impact Day on this date in 2020 to honor my late husband, Dr. Scott Vanstone, on his 73rd birthday, but and also to honor not only his global impact, but everyone from the University of Waterloo Math Faculty. It is exciting to have you all here with us today. Now, before we jump into our conversation, please note that this event is being recorded. I'd like to also remind you uh, that you will be muted. The attendees will be muted throughout the event. However, you may introduce yourself via the discussion board on the Profound Impact platform. Also, you may submit questions there and we will try to address them during the webinar or directly via the discussion board. Now we have plenty planned for you in the next hour. First up is Brian Romanski, who will be introducing our Profound Impact's newest product launching today, Research Impact. Next, we'll, we'll see short vid video messages from the three Impactful Actions Award finalist, and then I will announce our 2022 Impactful Actions Award winner. Next, there will be a fireside chat with today's award winner and the 2021 Impactful Actions Award recipient, Dr. Faridun Handelopper. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Brian Romanski, Chief Strategic Advisor to Profound Impact. Brian is an engineer and an invader with extensive experience in many areas, including data analytics. He will be introducing our new and exciting product, Research Impact. Over to you, Brian. Great, thanks, Sherry. So if you've been following along in previous uh, Profound Impact Day events, you'll know that uh, at Profound Impact, we've developed, launched, and worked with uh, research universities on a variety of, of products looking at alumni engagement and telling the story of, of researchers. We have done some work uh, looking at career paths of uh, researchers and uh, co-op students and helped uh, universities understand where their students are today. What we're gonna talk about today is the next iteration of, of that work. 
university research requires funding. Most of the world's challenges are going to be solved by uh, thought leaders at universities and private research labs. But to do the work that they, the important work that they're going to do, they need access to funding sources. Many of those funding sources are targeted, um, both federal, uh, state, and private funding sources will target specific outcomes, research outcomes that they want to get done. They might be targeting, say, cancer research or climate change or other environmental and social problems that they want to see solved. And the alignment between the uh, capabilities and skills of the researchers and the goals of those funding sources is really critical to uh, addressing problems that matter and, and to making sure that uh, researchers have the, the funds and the capabilities that they, they want. Uh, to achieve this, many universities and private institutions uh, have a team of research officers who act as matchmakers. These research officers have expertise and understanding of who are the key researchers at their organization, what their capabilities are, what their research goals are. And then they also uh, understand of the new grant opportunities that come out. They will understand uh, what those grants are targeted for, what the requirements are, what the eligibility requirements are, what the constraints are on those opportunities. And they will use that knowledge to try to do the matching between researchers and, and funding. Ideally, when that works well, they have fully funded research staff, they grow the university's reputation, and they achieve great, great research outcomes. However, what we heard from some of the previous work we had done was that these matches don't always go as smoothly as we'd like. So to better understand the problem, we did a, a quick uh, journey starting last year. We actually teamed up with Wilfrid Laurier University and we did a joint survey to better understand uh, how does this process work? How does the, those matches get communicated? How do they get made? And what kind of feedback do those research officers get on the process? Uh, so we've gone through a survey, we looked at the findings, we've shared those findings back. Some of you may have even participated in it, and, and we shared the results back with people who asked for it. I'm going to give a quick summary of that and then indicate where we're going next with that. So the survey went out to over 20 universities and research institutes. We talked to people at over 20 different roles, and we got uh, over 40 responses from across uh, research institutes and private research uh, labs across Canada. Uh, you can see we had institutes of various sizes with a research office ranging from say one to five people to up to over 20 people. And what we often find is that a research officer represents uh, somewhere between 50 and 150 or maybe even 200 researchers at many of these institutions. So you're looking at uh, people who represent the work of thousands of experts and, and researchers at, at universities and private labs to, to do this work. A couple of highlights of what we heard is that um, one of the challenges in this process is the relevance of what gets communicated out. So often that research officer, since they're dealing with you know, maybe a hundred or more different uh, researchers, they don't always have fine-grained detailed knowledge of exactly what that lab is trying to do. Uh, so often the things that they might recommend for a particular lab are not perfectly aligned. And then the method that they use to communicate it out is often done as a, a batch newsletter. So they'll send out an email or publish a newsletter on a website that says, you know, hey, for our you know, our earth sciences lab or for our health sciences lab, here's a set of opportunities, new grants perhaps that are coming out. And the expectation is that the individual researchers are gonna go through that list and figure out are some of these relevant to me or not and, and get back to them if they are. And then their metrics and ways of tracking this are not always ideal. Uh, the best practice is that the research officer will keep track of who's responded, how many opportunities they put out there but they don't always have the ability to do that. And usually if they do, they're keeping track of it on a private, a private spreadsheet or some sort of a, a personal list. And um, so it's, it's not shared among all the research officers and it's not always up to date. So the vision we got from this is this notion of this research officer who's under relentless pressure to do these matches, to help support the research institutions. They've got thousands of grants, new ones coming out every day. Uh, they have this challenge of doing this very complex matching process. They're not experts in these fields, and yet they're expected to understand which opportunities are best aligned with which research labs. Um, as I mentioned, they have over 100 researchers in many cases, and they have spreadsheets for different departments, different labs, different people. 
And this is complicated by the fact that these, these offices usually have high turnover. So these people might move from one university to another or change to a different role. So they're often relearning uh, the, the, the people and the processes and there's a steep learning curve to get up to speed. They often get a poor response rate when they send notifications out. They don't always get good feedback from the research teams. And then there's fierce competition. So when they're applying for funding, they know that their peers at other universities are also applying for the same funding. So they want to make sure that they're early and that they're relevant and they get the best, the best opportunities aligned. We did a quick market scan to say, you know, are we the only people thinking about this? And yes, we, we see that there are some other tools out there. Common themes among those other tools is that they often require that the researcher themselves learn how to use this new tool, that they actually log in and they, they actually use the tool. Often it's in the form of a search engine. So you as a researcher can go and search for grants that match you. The challenge we see with that is a lot of these researchers are busy. They want to spend their time doing meaningful research. They really don't want to spend a lot of time doing work of looking through grants and, and opportunities. They want somebody to help them with that. So we said, well, what if we did this differently? What if we could provide relevant and targeted matches to the researcher without them having to create a profile or spend a lot of their time doing administrative work, without them having to learn a new application or remember a new password to log into something um, and really help support the research office to do their job, but, but use, uh, make better use of their time actually helping apply for, for grants rather than just doing this matching problem. And if we did this, what would the outcome be? Well, it's a bit audacious, but we think if you do this successfully, we're gonna help produce better outcomes for society. We're gonna help produce, you know, move the needle on some of those key challenges um, that, that the world faces and, and make a real difference. And we're gonna help the universities who use the tool to actually increase their ranking. So they're gonna have more funding coming into their labs and they're going to uh, rank better. And then we're gonna make more effective use of the research officers themselves. They're actually gonna be helping do applications and the, the meaningful work of, of getting funding in and tracking the funding rather than doing this matching process. And ideally more engaged researchers who spend most of their time doing meaningful work as opposed to administrative work. Now, how do we do that? Very high level, a uh, couple of elements. This is the high level workflow of what the system does. A couple of key pieces to this. One is uh, an automatic grant opportunities feed. So we have a process that goes out and so pulls in grant opportunities from various websites, um, puts them into a common database, and then we apply some proprietary algorithms that we've developed in-house to do what we call matching. The matching will look at the capabilities of a researcher and apply that against the grant opportunities and the requirements, identify the highest probable matches, what we think is, is going to work best. And then instead of sending out a generic newsletter or creating a search engine that the researcher can use, we're actually gonna send out targeted messages to the, the researchers or professors to say, here's the matches that we found for you. And we're gonna track what feedback we get from them. So we have a closed loop process there. We did a quick experiment being a uh, an aggressive startup, rather than building this whole system out and, and investing a lot of time and effort into making all the technology work up front, we actually did a quick experiment. Again, working with Wilfrid Laurier University, we were able to pull in uh, funding information from a variety of, of federal and, and regional uh, funding sources. And we ran a match algorithm against a handful of professors. And we said, you know, is our algorithm good enough to make relevant matches? And the answer was yes, actually. The feedback we got from the research officers and, and the professors was that, yeah, these, these are actually more relevant than things they've, they've seen before. So again, the key at the, the center of all this is that proprietary matching algorithm, the way that we uh, pull in the automatically uh, grabbed or, or pulled in um, grant opportunities and the information we have about the professors, most of which we can get from websites and publications, and we do that automatic matching. This is a quick example of what one of those notification emails might look like. So rather than getting a broad newsletter that says, here's you know, 50 opportunities that you might want to apply for, Instead, we're going to the professor with one or two to say, here's some really high probability matches that we think are good for you. If you're interested, click here. If not, then just let us know and we'll change our algorithm so that we don't bug you with things that are not aligned anymore. And that I'm interested button is kind of magic because they don't have to do any kind of login. If they click on that button, it confirms that, okay, you're interested in this. The research officer will follow up with you. Here's the next steps of what's going to happen next. So they don't have to learn anything or do anything other than read their email and, and respond yes or no to these matches. And uh, from there, the process is largely automated. 
Now on the research officer side, they actually get a more rich dashboard where they get to see a, a nice single pane of glass view of here's all of my researchers and what, um, what opportunities I've shared with them and what kind of feedback I've gotten. And key to that is this metric. So you can imagine this is made up data, of course, but um, then in the future, we'll have detailed data of how many of those emails we sent out, how many were, were accepted, and how many um, were clicked through. And, and if somebody hasn't gotten back to me, I can give them a call or walk down the hall and, and talk to them in person so I can take it up a level if, if that's necessary. So again, very audacious goals, but that's research impact at a very high level. We think we can help solve some of the global challenges through better alignment of research with targeted funding. And we can also enable research institutions have a greater impact on the world. Thank you, Brian. We are so excited about research impact. Anyone who would like to learn more about it can contact either myself or Cheryl Petrosevic from our sales team. Contact the information will be provided at the end of this webinar. Next up, I am thrilled to turn to this year's Impactful Actions Award. It was inspiring to receive nominations from so many deserving individuals. And I wanna personally thank everyone who took the time and effort to nominate and those who shared their incredible stories with us. It was very difficult for the judges to decide on the three finalists and especially hard to pick a winner. Now, before I announce the winner, we have a short video of all, video message from our three finalists. We'll start with Kate Ekashan Basu, and then Dr. Mona Niemer and Dr. Neil Turek. We are incredibly grateful for them for having such a tremendous positive impact on our world. For me to be nominated for this award, it's a huge honor. It's a vindication of my belief that young people and young women are doing a lot for people and planet. And to be recognized for those efforts, I think it's just really amazing feeling. It's an honor to be nominated for the Impactful Actions Award. La science joue un rôle important dans nos vies que ce soit dans les politiques publiques ou les produits qui améliorent notre bien-être. Awards like this help raise awareness of the importance of science, research and innovation and serve as inspiration to future generations of leaders. Thank you to the nominating committee for recognizing the importance of science. Merci. If this prize encourages other people to step outside their comfort zone. You know, I was in my comfort zone in academia. I decided to try and step out of it to have a positive impact in the world. And I must say that really changed my life because you realize you can do so much more than you thought you could, even with the skills that you have. And the main thing is you get to meet amazing people. Thank you once again to the three finalists and you can read more about them uh, on the Profound Impact platform and in our news uh, Connection Impact newsletter. Now it's my great honor to present the 2022 Impactful Actions Award. This year, the award goes to Kekashan Basu. Now, before we invite Kekashan to say a few words, let me share with you her story. At, uh, at only 22 years old, Kekashan has been championing the human rights of marginalized communities since she was a child. At the age of 12, she started her own humanitarian organization, the Green Hope Foundation, and received Canada's Meritorious Service Medal. She is the only Canadian ever to be awarded the International Children's Peace Prize. Her work addresses the intersectionality of peace, human rights, and gender, all with the goal of reducing inequalities to create a better world. Remarkably, Kekashan's work has benefited more than 300,000 vulnerable women and girls in 26 countries. And you know, she's not stopping yet. Thank you for your efforts, Kekashan. And I am thrilled to name you as a winner of the 2022 Impactful Actions Award. 
a donation from Profound Impact will be made to, uh, to in your honor to the Green Hope Foundation to help you continue to make such a positive impact on the world. Now I invite you, Kekashan, to say a few words. Thank you so much, Sherry, and just thank you so much for this huge honor. I First of all, congratulations to my fellow nominees and finalists as well. And this award is really such a huge honor for me because it's just going to inspire me to continue to do more of my work and continue to make an impact. And once again, it does prove that every single person has the ability to be a change maker and to create positive impact in their communities and societies. And I hope to be able to continue to do that and live up to those expectations. So thank you once again. And thank you. And we just we we had put up a, a, a photo of the award. And sorry that we cannot be in person to hand it to you, but it will be uh, sent to you to, uh, shortly. Now, Dr. Farad and Handelopper, who is the former president and vice chancellor of the University of Waterloo and the 2021 Impactful Actions Award recipient, will join us now for a fireside chat with Kaekashan so that we can learn more about her work and aspirations. Dr. Handelopper is proud to have been one of the 10 global university presidents appointed to the United Nations He for She 10 by 10 by 10 campaign to engage boys and men in the cause of gender equity. Faridan has also served as the chair of the Waterloo Global Science Initiative, as well as taking active roles in many other committees and boards. Welcome, Dr. Handelopper. Great to have you back this year for Profound Impact Day. Thank you very much, Sherry, uh, for this very warm introduction. And it's absolutely great to be here today with all of you. Um, it is a great honor and pleasure uh, to be here today uh, with all of you. So good afternoon, everybody. And uh, Sherry, let me thank you first and Profound Impact for this incredible initiative and action. And uh, listening to my former colleagues, Mona and Neil, and of course, Kek Ashan, it was just fabulous to hear what contributions, what impacts they have made. So I was very honored. I was proud and humbled to have received last year's award. Uh, I, you know what you, what it did to me, um, it wouldn't let me just to sit back and say, well, oh, let me enjoy this moment. It inspired me more. It just made me more determined to work harder, to work with others, to make a kind of impact that the world is in need of. There are so many areas of tremendous societal importance that we need to work harder, we need to work together so that our impact could be felt, our impact will be very meaningful. So uh, Kekashan, I am just delighted to have this opportunity to have this conversation with you. Uh, I have my uh, fireplace in the background and I, I just don't want to think about that moment that I will actually physically need that fireplace, but it just warms our hearts up because we are celebrating something incredibly important. We're celebrating and acknowledging your tremendous success and contributions. So really like to, um, even though I read so much about you, I read so much about, you know, what you've been doing, but I'm still very curious. So are uh, our audiences. So Kekshad, you, since very early age, and you founded the Green Hope, but then the you've been involved since age 12 in so many areas, uh, gender equity, environmental sustainability, human rights, they're all tremendously important. But what is it that connects them? What is it that brings them together in your heart and your mind? Yes, thank you for that question. So something that I have noticed through all of my work is that 
you cannot address any of our global or local challenges in silos. We have to understand that all of these challenges are interconnected and therefore the solutions to address them also need to be just as interconnected. So that is why when I say that my organization is focused on all aspects of sustainable development and humanitarian impact, I mean literally all aspects because we work with, for example, primarily women and girls in extremely vulnerable communities that are impacted by climate change, that are impacted by drought, so food insecurity as well, lack of access to clean water and sanitation, lack of access to healthcare. So this is just one tiny example of how all of these challenges are just amplifying already existing inequalities within one community. And so that is why I've always found it very important to address all of these challenges together and adopt an intersectional approach. Lovely. So Kekshan, how do you, like one thing as an educator and a researcher, my everything I do is for the people who will carry this torch forward. So mostly the uh, I'm one of the uh, um, privileged people who gets to work with a lot of young people. But how do you make these like, you know, let's take these three examples. How do you make them? How do you make this outlook as a very organic, very natural element for the uh, for the young people? Yeah, so for I mean, I started out as a child in the field. So for me, it was very important that other children like me also had that passion for people and planet. I mean, I started Green Hope at 12, but I started my work uh, in the field of sustainability at seven. So it had been going on for quite some time. And what I realized is that children and young people particularly are often made to feel left out of all of these uh, discussions, decisions, because we are told from a young age that you have to grow up in order to make an impact, you have to reach a certain age in order to make an impact, and the importance of small everyday actions that every single person, regardless of their age, can take, that really gets discounted. So what I wanted to do was to take away that notion to ensure that young children and young people really feel included and understand that they are very much a part of the solution. And you do not need to turn 18 or uh, 30 or 50 to be a change maker. You can do that no matter how old you are. So that is the first approach that we at Green Hope Foundation adopt. Uh, the second one is providing them with the skills, tools, behaviors to be able to bring about the change. So we strongly believe in education for sustainable development as the transformative tool. So through our academies, which are peer-to-peer uh, -peer led, so by children and young people, for children and young people, we are able to foster that peer-to-peer -peer communication where these children and young people see others like themselves as role models. And then we convert that education into grand level actions. And the best way we are able to prove to them that their actions do count is by showing them the impact that all of these actions have had. Now we deal with a lot of complex challenges and we understand that we are not gonna see the results of these solutions right away. It can take years, decades even, but there are small impacts, positive impacts that do uh, benefit society and benefit the planet. And that is what we encourage them to see, to understand that their actions are having a positive impact, learning from that positive impact and working to replicate and localize it all across the world. So that is how we make children and young people understand that they are part of the solution. Wonderful. Kekshan, when you said, regardless of how old you are, and I said, hey, I, uh, I'm i going to take this uh, 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 myself as an example, because it's really your work has been very inspirational for me personally. And I can only imagine how young people will be inspired. I mean, regardless of what they age they are, whether this is part of their playbook, whether this is part of their education, it is 
seen there and i love the way you said it give it some time yeah impact is continuous but impact is also immediate because it is being done today so that's absolutely uh wonderful to extend it to a large spectrum of age groups uh that the issues we we're talking about they are real and they have to be acted upon and thanks to you a lot more people are aware of these so let me twist it a little bit more we have a number of people who are with us today and listening to you very carefully and feeling really good about meeting you what advice would you give them uh say well okay I'm glad that you're enjoying this conversation but all of us need to do something uh what would advice would you give to our audience today yeah my simplest advice is always starting by educating yourself and then educating your family and then educating your community and I think that sometimes the power of education gets forgotten because people think that may just like what use is it going to be like just no not I'm not just talking about book textbook education but just how is that awareness going to help but you cannot solve a problem if you don't know what the problem is in the first place and education can help you understand the problem and then give you the tools and skill sets to solve that problem so that is my main advice and then working to localize solutions so yes so I am also curious um Hikshan. you want some water oh I'm good thank you uh I said you want some water as if I could get you some water but yeah. <laughs> there's some there take a moment um you've always you, you you've always also been a very successful student how did you manage all these like when academically um you move forward you're successful but also you enjoyed life at the same time you spent enormous amounts of time and made a lot of impact in the areas that we talked about how did you manage all these balls uh how did you juggle those yes so for me my career and my education I've always tried to find ways to connect them because both are equally important to me and I decided like when I started at seven that I would not sacrifice one for the other so creating positive impact on the ground was just as important as getting excellent grades and that's something that I have worked to maintain throughout uh and I had to learn how to manage my time effectively so time management was a skill that definitely uh, helped a lot because for me it was just about understanding like when I focused my energy on which aspect uh, of my life and really both succeeding in both my education and in my career brought me tremendous joy so I never felt like I was missing out or that I should have done something else because I was gaining maximum fulfillment from doing both and I can't really see it uh, happening uh, any other way even as I move forward and as someone who is talking about the importance of education uh, in my work I am definitely not going to give up my education like I'm going to practice what I preach so that aspect was really important as well and particularly I think that you know a lot of the time people and young people and children are told that oh you can't do anything for people and planet because you have to focus on your studies and I feel that you know it's not one or the other you can learn about taking care of people and planet in your classroom and you can implement that both in your classroom and outside it and you what you learn from the ground you can also implement it in your classroom or your lecture hall so you know that is something that I have worked to implement throughout my life and really uh, creating this kind of symbiotic relationship between my education and uh, my career and sure like you know I have to work 
10 times harder than my peers to make sure that I'm able to succeed in both. But I think that is a cost that I'm willing to pay uh, because at the end of the day, I want to be able to succeed in both. So time management and understanding like that I am super passionate about both. And I have that for me, it's so important that I give my attention to both. So really, that is how I managed to do my education and uh, have a career at the same time. Wonderful. Um, as Sherry mentioned, I'm involved in uh, so many things, but just recent, just um, you know, very recently, I just published a new journal paper with my PhD student, and the feeling was the same as when I published my very first journal paper. So this is an incredible. So I'm 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 trying relating to what you were just saying. It is inspirational. It wants to make me work even, you know, have more PhD students and continue the research because it also makes a big impact. Okay. So you've just received this incredible award. Okay. Uh, what a what a great award to be recognized for your contributions. And to 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 be together with my two former colleagues, uh, Mona, you know, um, science advisor for our entire country, uh, Neil, an incredible scientist individual. I had the pleasure of working with him a lot for, with both of them. So you have this award. So are you going to go home and say, well, okay, I have reached Nirvana. I, I don't need to do anything else. Here's the award. Here's the impact I made. Or, of course, I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> what is next for you what will take where will this take you and what do you see as the future of advocacy and the green hope foundation from this day forward yeah so you know my work never stops and this award you know once again it's just serves as more inspiration for me to keep doing my work and to do more so th that that is just how i see any kind of uh recognition and this award such a huge honor and to be selected out of like people who are doing so much in their fields yes it's just giving me that extra push to keep going and do more so green hope foundation as i speak our chapters are working on the ground just this morning in rural bangladesh our team uh took out their solar powered mobile library uh going around to more villages now than before uh in canada our members as partners of the toronto district school board we provide them with environmental education so our members there are continuing to impart that uh to their peers uh, so you know we have a lot of things going on like right now and there's a lot more that's coming as well and you know we're living in very very trying times and the need to be able to inspire children and young people to bring about change in their own communities and intersectional change in their own communities like that need is very, very high. And that is what we are hoping to meet. So across our 26 countries, we are working, we are constantly looking to see uh, how much more can we do, where can we help, and how can we inspire others to take uh, action as well. So yes, that is the future of the organization as well. And one thing I always like to say is that when like working towards a sustainable, and equitable planet, like, yes, there is a lot that needs to be done, but even when we achieve that uh, utopia, uh, we will have to work to maintain that. So our work literally never stops. And that is kind of the mantra that we follow at Green Hope Foundation as well. Thank you, Kekishan. Um, I think you partially answered what I'm about to ask you, but I would like you to really expand a little bit more and add probably another um aspect to it. so you 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 said it yourself we are living in a period of social economic political instability around the world but the world has never been free of these instabilities if you look at the uh, history one way or another but if you look at the current day every day we are and rightfully so concerned about the effect of climate change how it's impacting, affecting lives and how worse it may get and what are we doing about it. 
um, the war in with Ukraine and Russia, the instability in the Middle East, and I can give you a whole list of things. When you list those, it's quite easy to get pessimistic about the future. Yet, listening to you, hearing about what you've been doing, but also the, the, the brief outlook you gave about what Green Hope is destined and determined to do, I quickly push this pessimism away uh, that it still looks good. How could you, could you expand on this a little bit more? And especially um, the younger generation who are just looking at the, into this world and saying, what am I getting myself into? <laughs> so I want you to make that picture a little bit different, if you could. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. You know, I named my organization Green Hope Foundation. So I've always had hope for the future. And I understood that if you don't have hope, then you're you're lost. You know, you can't really do anything because if you're hopeless, then the drive to bring about change, that that's gone. So I always think that you know, there, there, we have the ability to find hope even in the most dire of circumstances. And yes, as you rightly said, our world, there's always been instability and inequity in our world. Now, people are getting to know more about this. Something that I have seen, like this trend, is that a lot of these inequalities used to affect the global south primarily and now that the global north is also facing the impacts we're kind of like oh now it's facing our world but really these challenges have been faced like we've been facing these challenges for a really really long time climate change is one of those primary examples you know so and the impacts of climate change as well including drought and food insecurity that's something that we in the global north are also facing now so the world is waking up i think and you know, I have faith in human ingenuity, and I think that we have faced so many challenges throughout all the time that humans have been on the earth, and we've been able to come out of that. So I think that is something that gives me hope as well, that, you know, we will, we have the resources, like not just externally, but we just have that potential ourselves to bring about change as well and to maintain that hope by seeing those positive impacts of our actions and i think going from there that's that's really important and particularly children and young people particular and children especially i have seen that you know faced with all of these challenges they still have so much hope and they have so much of these like so many of these solutions that then you think that why didn't I think of that? Because I think as adults that we're kind of bogged down by cynicism a lot because we've seen what the world, uh, how the world can be like, but the children haven't seen that. So their solutions are so uninhibited and they're not restricted by the cynicism. I think that gives me hope as well. And that is why I feel it's so important to engage children right from their childhood so that they're not just you know, introduced to these challenges when they're 18 and then they think that, oh my gosh, like, what am I going to do with all of this? They're taught from a young age that yes, these challenges are there and yes, it is possible to address them and mitigate them. And that is why we use education for sustainable development and Green Hope Foundation to ensure that these children and young people have the hope for the future because they're able to then turn that hope and the dream of a better world into reality and into ground level actions. Yeah. And yes, they don't have to wait for somebody else to come up with a solution. They can be part of that solution. They can find the solution. Yeah. So, so far we talked about how individuals can be inspired by your work, how the impact could be, uh, inspirational for a lot of people, young, middle age, age, doesn't matter what age. How do you take this to organizations, companies, profit, nonprofits, governments, and expand it at those levels that they are also seeing this? I mean, it's perfectly fine uh, for governments. Hey, I want to get reelected, but I also want to 
make a positive contribution. I want to make my society, societies, country, whatever in the world, a better place. But in the meantime, I want to get reelected for companies to say, yes, uh, we are here to grow the shares of our shareholders that are, but also while doing this, we want to be making a positive impact. So what will be your message? How would you carry this message forward to much broader uh, groups of people? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I believe that every single sector of society has a role to play. And with civil society, uh, private sector, government, academia, faith-based organizations, every single sector, and, and so much more, like every single sector has a unique role to play. Gov uh, I'll start by addressing government. So we at Green Hope Foundation actually do work with a lot of governments around the world and a lot of education ministries, environment ministries. One such example is uh, of Suriname, which is the world's most forested country. And we have seen there like just how amazing the relationship between government and civil society is and how beneficial it can be when government, private sector and civil society all work together to preserve the unique forest cover that they have. So we work with governments all across the world and we always say that, you know, it's not government versus people. It should that should never be the case, and particularly in democratic institutions. It should be government representing the needs and wants of the people. And if we start from a young age with that education that tells every single person and every single child that taking care of people and planet, that is how I can become successful. And that is what is necessary. I think that even the officials who stand for election, they would have that mindset within them because they got that education from a very, very young age. And the voters would have that mindset as well because they received that education. So once again, it comes back to education uh, because like, you know, you educate a child about taking care of people and planet. And when they, when in this case, when they do grow up and come into positions of power, they would be able to put that education to good use. And government is no different. And having educated officials and having educated voters in that sense is extremely important. Honestly, the same goes for private sector as well. I think that, you know, we have, we often do villainize private sector a lot and sometimes rightfully so because so many of our uh, problems, especially environmental problems rise from uh, private sector not acting in accordance with people and planet. Even here, you educate a child and if they go into the private sector, they would be able to find the balance between profit, people, and planet. And it's important to get all of these voices to the table as well, because if you just alienate them and not understand where they're coming from, then we are not really going to be able to see any change. And for the private sector, I'll, I'll give an example. So right now I'm doing my MBA at Cornell. And when I told people about this, the first reaction from so many of them was, how is that related to what I'm doing to sustainability, to humanitarian impact? Because none of them could fathom the fact that private sector could actually do something for people and planet. And the reason I decided to get uh, an MBA is because I wanted to be able to understand the inner workings of the private sector and see how best we could ensure that the private sector is also able to move towards uh, sustainable development. So yes, uh, that is really how all of these sectors can work together. And at Green Hope Foundation as well, we work with private sector to ensure that they're able to achieve their ESG targets, that their CSR is not something that is tokenistic and providing them with that sustainability consulting so that they're not seen as the villain, but instead they're seen as a sector that can actually benefit people and planet. Delighted to hear that uh, you're working with so many different sectors, but also connecting them together. So um, I'm going to get, uh, we have a few minutes left. I'm going to get a little personal, if you don't mind. Um, one of the biggest moments of inspiration for me, just to allow me to be curious about everything around me was 
when I watched the uh, moon landing as a, as a as a child. And I had so many questions and I realized that there were orders of magnitude more questions than uh, 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 the answers were available. So I was very curious about everything. That is the foundation of me becoming a researcher in education. So you have done some fabulous things. What was it that gave you that trigger? Was it an event? Was it a person? How did it all happen? Well, I was very fortunate to grow up in a family where like empathy for people and planet, that was our normal. I saw my parents go out every weekend to distribute food and clothes to the less fortunate. And I used to accompany them. Uh, my grandmother to this day has an organic uh, terrace garden where she grows her own fruits and vegetables. So I really believed that every single person uh, had that understood that that was their innate responsibility to care for people and planet. Uh, but when I was seven and I saw the image of a dead bird with its belly full of plastic, it was then that I realized that the rest of the world did not think like me or my family because how else could something so horrible happen? And how else could we as human beings just be so careless and uh, just inhuman, really? So that is what really made me decide that I would start taking my own actions to help the planet and help uh, the community. And that led me to uh, plant my first tree on my eighth birthday. And my birthday is World Environment Day, 5th June. So I always thought that this was my mission on Earth to really make our planet and make are better for all and better for human beings as well. And slowly and steadily, you know, I got to know more about all of these challenges our world was facing because I thought to myself that if this has happened, surely there are other things that have ha bad things that have happened as well. And I want to be able to do something to address that. So as a very, very curious child, I started reading more, researching more, asking my parents more, and I got all of this information. And that is how slowly and steadily I was able to start my work for uh, people and planet. What I, what I did find strange was that, you know, when I told my friends initially about this, uh, a lot of, some of them were like very, very receptive, but some of them didn't understand like why this is something that, uh, we should be focusing on because, well, it, it just didn't seem very important. And then I realized that they thought that way because they didn't even know that these things existed and that they could do something to be a part of it. And so that is how I realized that education had to be a very important part of everything that I was doing. And so when I started Green Hope Foundation, like five years after I got my calling to do something for people and planet, I decided to have education as the cornerstone. So really, that is how I started out. And a Green Hope Foundation was started because I was uh, the, one of the youngest speakers at the Rio Plus 20 Earth Summit, the largest sustainable development conference of the time. And out of 50,000 delegates, there were only five people below the age of 18. And so I realized that I again, had to do something to address the severe lack of inclusivity. And mm -hmm. that is how Green Hope Foundation came about. Okay, Kishan, we could, I could just listen to you all day. And I'm sure that our audience would love to do that too. But I want to thank you for this incredible conversation. Uh, it is truly inspiring. And um, big, big congratulations again for, for what you have achieved and what you will be doing. Uh, we will be watching. And I hope that one day we will get the pleasure and honor of meeting you in person. All the best to you. Thank you so much for what you, you're doing. And with that, uh, Sherry, I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to have this conversation with Kekashan. And over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank, it's a special thanks to you, Farid, and for being with us and leading such an interesting discussion. And again, congratulations to the 2022 Impactful Actions Award winner, Kekashan Basu. And as Faridun says, we're looking forward to seeing and staying in touch and understanding of how you continue to have such uh, impact on the, on the world. 
And I hope everyone who's listening today will consider making a donation to the Green Hope Foundation in Kekoshan's honor. The website is greenhopefoundation.com. And I believe the information is gonna be put up on the screen soon. Um, and in addition, uh, if you're interested in our new research and pet offering, please don't hesitate to contact me or Cheryl Pet Petrasevic. I wanna thank everyone for attending the third annual Profound Impact Day. Note that the recording of this webinar will be available here on the Profound Impact platform within a few days. Please let your network know so that they too can be inspired by Kekoshan's impact. And I wanna thank you again, our audience, for your support. Please make your week an impactful one and let's all work together to connect great people to do great things. Goodbye. <laughs>